all for joining today. The last talk of the conference, uh, your troopers. Um, my, the title of my talk is Explain It to Me Like Your Five Learnings from User Research with Kids. Uh, I gave this talk at DrupalCon in Nashville, and um, I had a really nice guy come up to me afterward and say, you know, oh, cool talk. I saw it, it was great. But I got to say, me and my friends only went to this because we thought like your title was a metaphor for something Drupal-y, something development, like, I don't know, maybe like testing with kids is like hacking the core. It's super dangerous. You shouldn't do it. Um, so I hope he wasn't too disappointed. There's no development. There's no Drupal in this talk. It is literally about doing user research with kids. So if you thought this was going to be a development talk and you'd rather not spend the next like 45 minutes listening to this, uh, I get it. If you want to go, your time is precious. I'm like the only person standing between you and the after party. So no hard feelings if you go. Um, but if you are interested in learning about user research, I'd love to tell you, uh, tell you more about it. Um, so a little bit of background uh, about myself and my company. Uh, so I work at MyPlanet, we're a software studio here in Toronto, um, and we make smarter interfaces that focus on the workplace. Uh, so what that means is a lot of our clients are um, kind of B2B facing uh, people. They might be trying to build internal tools for their own employees or portals for their customers to come in and manage like all the servers that they buy. Um, so, so really a strong B2B focus. Um, and we're trying to leverage some of um, the newer technologies like AR and VR. Um, and uh, personalization to just try to make the experience a little bit easier and faster for the folks using the tool so that they can get in and out more quickly um, and do their work more easily. Uh, so yeah, we're about, I think, a little over 100 people now uh, worldwide, uh, mostly in Toronto, but we've got some on the West Coast and some in Europe as well. Um, and that's all of our social media, et cetera, stuff. If you want to at, at us, get at us. Um, and about myself, uh, it's still not working. Oh. It seemed to work like if I was literally almost eating it. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'll just get real close to it. I'm gonna lip gloss all over this, it's cool. Um, so about myself, my name is Kara. Um, I like to call myself a recovering academic, so I started my research journey um, doing my PhD in cognitive psychology and research psychology. Um, and when I graduated, I decided that I wanted to focus on some more real world problems. So I joined my planet about five and a half years ago as a researcher and interaction designer. And that's all my stuff if you wanna get at me. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today? Um, we're going to spend a bit of time just going over um, user research as a concept, the different types of research that we're all on the same page. Um, I'll spend a bit of time talking about getting set up before you even go into your first testing sessions, so all the prep work that you need to do. Um, then I'll dig into some sort of tips and tricks and strategies for what you can do inside the session to make it go more smoothly. Um, and then finally I'll end off with just some logistics, so like little bits that uh, we all tend to forget, but if we do take care of it in advance, um, it tends to make things go a lot more smoothly. All right, so, whoa, <laughs> there I am. Thank you, this turned into like a Foo Fighters concert. Uh, is that, now I'm like afraid to be too close. Is that okay? It's not, all right, thank you. Uh, thanks at the back for helping out. Um, so right, user research, what is it and what is it good for? Um, so some of you are already probably familiar with the different stages of research um, early in a project, but just to get us all on the same page, I tend to think of the research in two stages. Uh, first, there's the discovery research. So that's where you're trying to understand the goals and the needs and the pain points and attitudes of people who might be using your product. Uh, you're trying to figure out if the features that you're thinking about are going to offer utility for the users of your product and also maybe discover some new needs that they have that you hadn't thought about before. Um, and then once you're a little bit further along in your design process, you'll also want to do some research around the experience of actually using your product. So can people understand how to use it? Do things make sense? Do they know how to get from A to B? Um, this is where usability testing comes in. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper into what each of these kinds of research entails. Um, so for discovery research, let's say you're trying to build an e-learning app so people come to your site or your app to try to find training and content related to whatever they're interested in. Uh, before you even start designing, you're going to want to find some people who um, uh, would want to use this tool, so people who want to consume content in this way. Um, and you might bring them in for some sort of in-depth one-on-one interviews um, and observations to try to understand the context and the needs that they're, they're coming to your product with. Um, so as you're doing this research, you might find that different clusters or types of users come out. So you might have um, some users fall into like a busy professional category, while others are more learning uh, just for hobbies, like based on their own interest. Um, and these two groups, even though they're probably going to do similar things on your site, they're going to search and look for content, um, they're going to come to it with very different mindsets. So the professional person might be um, 
under a bit of a time crunch. They need to know like exactly what marketable skills you're going to get out of this uh, this uh, content they're consuming. Uh, maybe they've been put on like the dreaded performance improvement plan at work, so they're kind of like stressed out about it all, and they, they really need to catch up. Um, so there might be some urgency there. Uh, but for the person who's a bit more of a hobbyist, uh, they're just kind of learning in their spare time, um, they might be a bit more open to exploring. They've got more time to check things out, to kind of poke around. But on the flip side, they might need more guidance to tell them what types of content are available and more inspiration about what they might want to look at. Um, they might also need a little bit more motivation to stay engaged because they don't actually have to do the content, they're just kind of doing it for fun. Um, so doing the research can reveal these different types of needs and mindsets um, and tell you the different goals and workflows that your users are likely to have. Uh, but beyond that, it can also help you understand what we call the experience criteria. So this is how users want to feel when they're using your product. And of course, like everyone's going to say, oh, I want it to be like easy and intuitive and, and you know, really seamless. Everyone says that about every product, so that's, that's all well and good. Um, but there's like more aesthetic things to think about, like do they want it to feel playful or serious? Do they want it to be like really pressure free and really supportive? Or do they want that like little bit of competition in there? Um, so doing some user research is going to help you um, get some input to help inform those design, uh, design decisions that you're doing. Um, so once you've done your discovery research, you kind of have a good idea about what product you want to build, what features you want to have in there, um, you're going to start your design process. And as you do that, um, it's equally important to test that what you're making is actually understandable and easy to use for your users. So when it comes to usability testing, you present your users with some form of interface, um, and this can be as low fidelity as like pen and paper sketches that you're putting in front of uh, people and, get, and getting their feedback on, um, to wireframes, to clickable prototypes, and like Envision or Axure, um, or it can be like a fully coded functioning site that you want to do usability checkup on. So any level of fidelity um, you can and should do testing. Um, the goal here is to present users with the interface and then ask them to go through some common or frequent tasks that you might have uh, in your product. Um, and then you just kind of sit back and watch them do it and ask some probing questions along the way. Um, and as you do this observation, it's going to reveal really important UX issues like maybe it's not clear in the workflow how to get you know, to the next step or it's not clear how to navigate to key parts of the system. Uh, maybe the terminology is not clear and it's really obscure for users um, or calls to action aren't where they expect them to be so that they get missed or they're not obvious enough. Um, or sometimes we realize that there are use cases and, and sort of edge cases that we didn't even think about that users try to do and you're like, oh crap, I totally forgot to design how you get out of this section of the site. Um, so doing that testing early and often is going to help you catch those mistakes before you move into the code because it's always going to be more costly, more you know, time sucking and more soul draining, I think, to try to fix it in code uh, versus when you're still in the design phase. Um, yeah, so by doing this early and often, Often, um, you sort of fix a problem that you find, present the next version to users in your next round of testing, and just validate that you actually have solved that problem and they can now do the task successfully. Um, and by doing this, you kind of stack the, the cards in your own favor uh, for building a product in the end that's actually usable and robust in the way that you need. All right, so why should you care about usability and user testing? Why is this important to you? Uh, well, if you're a designer, um, hopefully the reasons I presented were compelling enough or you've already been convinced and you don't need me to talk about it. Uh, and maybe that's also true for product owners and developers, but uh, for product owners, it's really helpful for you to see the user testing sessions and understand the context and the pain points that these people have because it's gonna help you make those tough decisions when it comes to prioritizing. So you can say, you know, well, we know stakeholder that you really love feature Y, but based on the research that we've done, like that's a nice to have for people, but what they really need to do is task X. So you can have some, um, I don't want to say ammunition because it sounds like you're fighting with your client, which is never good, uh, but some, I guess, context or background to help you inform those decisions, to rationalize those uh, decisions. So it can help you with uh, uh, product scope and release planning. Um, and for developers, it's going to help with all those like little front end decisions that you, you inevitably end up making. I think the first few times I worked with devel developers, um, I was really surprised at the amount of design decisions they had to do because working in like a fast paced agile environment, designers don't always have time to comp out like every single state, every breakpoint, every format, every edge case. So it, it falls on the developer shoulders to make those decisions. And sure, you can chat with the designers about it, but if you have a really solid foundation and understanding of what your users are going to do in your product, it's going to be a lot easier for you to just say, oh, you know what, I think it should look like this, and then, you know, if the designer doesn't like it, we can deal with it, but uh, it's going to be a lot faster for you. Um, it's also going to give you some context for deciding on um, or suggesting solutions for problems that might be out of scope. So. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure I've never done this to any of my developers, but I've heard that sometimes devs get designs handed to them and they're, they just start laughing because it's like, okay, this one component is going to take us half the project to build. Like, there's no way we can do this. We have to simplify it. Um, and of course, you can always work with the designers to figure out another, another way to do it. Um, but if you've been in these sessions, you see the behaviors of these people, you know their goals, um, it's more likely that a solution will jump to your mind for, well, you know what, they can still accomplish this goal, but in this way, that's like way less effort and less time for me to build out. Um, so that just like elevates the team as a whole. Um, and then finally, um, it gives you a leg up on UAT. So we find that when devs and, and product people sit in on our testing sessions, they notice a lot of these little bugs, whether it's just like, oh, this needs more padding or this filter isn't like showing all the terms that we need it to show. Um, and you, some of them are really quick fixes that you can just note and kind of fix in line in the sprint instead of waiting until the UAT period and then you have like a backlog of a million things, which is never fun. Um, so it can, get, it can help you sort of keep um, keep those things under control. Um, and then finally, I'd say that for everyone, one really great effect of user testing and observing user research is that it keeps us really empathizing with our users. And I know personally when I work on a project and it's like month four and I'm deep in the weeds, I get kind of like, you know, stuck on a problem and I forget the big picture of, of what we're actually doing this for. And presenting your work in front of users and seeing them say like, oh my god, this is awesome, like when is it going to be real, when can I use it? Or even if it's critical feedback, it can be really um, re-energizing, I guess, to, to keep us all aware of the big picture and aware of where we're actually, who we're actually building this thing for. Um, so I think that's, that's one kind of side benefit that's really important. All right, so hopefully I've made a case for how the research process can help um, all of us in our work. Um, but why test with kids specifically? Um, well, obviously, if your product is designed for children, you should be testing with children because that's your demographic. You want to understand their motivations and goals. And as you can see with this poor cat child trying to drink water, um, things designed for adults don't always translate well to, to kids. Um, and beyond the fact that the kids are just physically smaller, they also think differently about a lot of stuff. So they expect their digital interactions to be like wild and zany and colorful and fun and I guess we've just been trained to like accept boring interfaces um, but kids want that kind of like rich experience um, and a lot of things that adults do very naturally online prove to be very challenging for kids. So for instance, um, we had one um, older child, I think she was about 10 or 11, um, she had uh, trouble with the concept and the label of filtering, a uh, very common web behavior, but for her she hadn't had a lot of experience with websites that do that. Um, so in that, in that instance it was a, a web experience based thing, but sometimes kids just don't have like the mental construct even built up for to represent like the thing that the interface is supposed to represent. So the maturity and the development of the child can throw um, kind of a wrench into the works. Um, so that kind of stuff is really good to catch early on. Um, and even if what you're building is intended for adults to use, uh, doing a bit of research with younger children can help your product integrate better into people's lives and homes. Um, so one kind of product that springs to mind for this are things like smart home speakers like Google Home or Amazon Echo. Um, these certainly aren't products that are marketed at children, they're not toys, they're not for kids, but they're in home environments where children live and play and they say all kinds of weird things. Um, and sometimes you get like a little customer delight where like, I don't know, the kid is really happy when they ask Alexa to make a dinosaur fart noise and then she does it and she, they're like yay um, but sometimes it goes a little haywire like I'm sure you guys probably remember this video that went around I think like a couple years ago where a little boy was trying to get Alexa to play his favorite song but because he wasn't enunciating in the way an adult would Alexa kind of misheard and then started returning some results that were like very not safe for kids not safe for work um, and the parents were like oh Alexa stop no um, so like if you test with children, you might catch those moments of delight and capitalize on that, but you might also catch those red flags, those issues that, that might crop up, um, that wouldn't have cropped up if you'd only talked to adults. Um, and then finally, when you simplify and streamline an interface to make it easy enough for a kid to use, you inadvertently make it easier for everybody to use. So whether it's a typical adult who's just like not focusing on the interface because they're multitasking or tired or whatever, um, or someone who doesn't fluently read or speak the language that your app is in, um, someone with a physical impairment, a cognitive constraint, um, making something so easy a kid can use it also makes it easy enough for everyone else to use it. Um, 
and I'm not saying, you know, if your product is meant to be used by a special population, you should always test with that population because that's going to give you the best data. Um, but while my talk today is focused on techniques and strategies to use uh, when you're testing children, um, I'm hoping that a lot of these can form the, the sort of foundation or, or inspire ideas for those of you who do need to test with other populations in the future as things to keep in mind or, or things that you can leverage. Um, and then finally, just to give you a little bit of context about some of the examples that I'll be talking about today, um, a lot of this is going to come out of work that we're doing with the Girl Guides of Canada. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it, Canadian nonprofit for girls. Um, you probably know them best for their cookies, which are, that was like a workplace hazard for me, being so close to them for so long. Um, but they also do a lot of cool work to help young girls, uh, girls and young women, um, find different interests, foster their, their self-confidence, and just build real life skills that are um, really relevant for the challenges that they're facing today. In, in you know some of the challenges that we didn't have to face when we were younger. Um, so my plan has been working with them to move all of their programming related content and activities into a digital format because previously it was all in like literal paper books uh, which was not very scalable or adaptable. Um, so our challenge was that girls as young as five years old all the way up to 17 could be girl members so they could be guides um, plus there are also adult members uh, the guiders who facilitate the meetings. So we needed to make something that was uh, fun and easy enough that potentially a five-year-old might even use it, but wouldn't be alienating or seem too babyish for like a teenager, um, and would also offer the robust functionality that an adult guider would need to like organize meetings and take attendance and, and all that stuff. Um, so with that in mind, we carried out both uh, discovery and usability research, um, and some of the anecdotes and assets that we shared will uh, just come out of that experience. Um, so setting it up, uh, before anything else, preparation is the key to success quote from Alexander Graham Bell, who we know is an amateur, um, but I also found it recently he got into sheep breeding later in life. I don't know why, but he was really into that, so there's a tidbit for your next trivia night. Um, so once you've decided that you want to do some user research, you're going to need to decide whether you want to do in-person testing or remote testing, and both have their pros and cons. So in-person testing is almost always going to give you richer data. Um, you can see participants' facial expressions and physical reactions to things, which can tell you a lot more than what they're just saying on the phone or even in a video chat. Um, this is going to be especially true for younger children who might be shy or unable to express their thoughts for whatever reason. Um, and certainly if you're testing with a population like with visual impairments, with whatever, you definitely want to be in their environment as much as possible. Um, uh, yeah, and you can also see the environment where they're going to use this app. So maybe, you know, using your iPad game in an office is easy and fun, but you realize the kid using it is actually sitting in, like, the playroom in the basement that doesn't have good lighting, and then their sister is, like, trying to grab the thing away from them. Um, so you, you get to see that in motion. Um, or maybe they're going to be using your site on, like, a school library computer that's, like, running IE8 and won't let you download anything and, like, times out after 20 minutes. So seeing that, um, that real-life context can really um, highlight some considerations that you might not have uh, been aware of. Um, but remote testing also has its benefits. Uh, you can be a lot more inclusive and talk to kids from a much wider range of demographics and backgrounds, uh, both in terms of geography and in terms of like so, uh, socioeconomic um, status, uh, which can be important for a lot of products if you want to be inclusive. Um, and it's just a lot faster to test remotely. People don't have to worry about inviting you into their homes. You don't have to travel to them. You just have to like set up the screen share or whatever. Um, and then off you go. So for our work, we did a mix of the two. Uh, for the younger kids, um, about like under the ages of nine or 10, we stuck to in-person sessions for the most part, although we, we did do some remote sessions, which were a bit wobbly. So I would say for kids under 10, stick with in-person if, if you have, have at all possible. Um, but for the older uh, kids and for the adults, we tested them remotely using like Skype and Hangouts, and that worked well. Okay, so once you've decided that you want to test uh, in person or remotely or both, you're going to need to set, find some volunteers. You'll need to find some participants. Um, but not like that, a Hunger Games volunteering scenario is not what we want. Uh, so what can you do instead if you're not going to like conscript users? Um, if you're like us, you might luck out and work with a really great client that has access, like direct access to a big pool of participants and will do the recruiting for you. Um, in that case, we provided the Girl Guides of Canada with some email templates just describing um, what would happen in the task that they could send out to the parents. We also gave them our criteria for like, we want girls from this age to that age and these types of branches from these types of environments. Um, and they worked really hard to set that up for us. 
Um, you definitely want to factor in a lot of lead time. So even with this kind of like blue sky scenario, it still took us about two to three weeks to get all of our participants for the first round set up. Um, and especially if you're working with an organization that has like, like marketing has to review every communication that goes out or God forbid legal has, to, if they have to review it, like double that. Uh, so give yourself lots of lead time. Um, but if you don't have a client that has access to users, uh, there are other ways to recruit. Um, if you have any connection at all with an after-school group, like swimming classes, sports, music, whatever, um, try to capitalize on that. So you can give, um, you know, ask your friend if they'd feel comfortable, or if it's you, ask yourself if you'd feel comfortable talking to other parents about the research. Um, you can give your friends a handout that just lists, you know, who you are, what you're going to be doing, um, what's expected of their kid, um, and importantly, any incentives. That's always a big um, draw for people, so we've done cash incentives um, in the past, uh, or gift cards for the parents to just sort of incentivize them to volunteer their kid um, for our activities. Um, you can also try recruiting online, blast your own social media networks, um, posting in a topic focus group. So I know that there's like Facebook groups for parents based on neighborhoods. So if you've got friends in those groups, you can see if they would feel comfortable posting. Um, and there's also some boards that um, regularly post marketing or user research opportunities. Like that we've had success on buns, actually. We've posted some on there. Um, you can take this into the real world as well. Put up posters where you think young families are likely to hang out. Uh, the library, for example. Uh, you know, swimming pools, daycares, restaurants, um, where, wherever you think uh, families are going to be. Um, and of course, you'll have to get permission first. Um, if you are really lucky, you might try the same thing with the school. If you've got an in with like someone on the school board or a principal or something, although there's probably going to be a lot more red tape there. Um, and then worse comes to worse, or if you just have lots of money, you can use a recruitment agency. That'll be your most expensive option because uh, you have to pay them to do the work, uh, but it can be a lot faster and also help you out if you don't have a lot of resources to, to tackle that. Um, so if all of this seems like a lot of work, uh, that's because it is. Every project I do, I can't believe how much time we sink into setting this up. Um, but once you get the ball rolling, once you have your template set up, your pool, you know, kind of, you know, a, it's a warm introduction the next time. Um, the next rounds of recruitment will go a lot more quickly. I will say that you should recruit way more people than you think you need. Like if you want 10 people, reach out to at least 50 people. Like a 20% return is already really good, especially for a cold call. Um, you know, spam everybody. Uh, you can always decline and say, you know, oh, we filled up all our slots this round, but can we keep your info on hand for the next rounds that we do? Um, and people will always say yes. Um, and it'll give you a backup pool too for when people cancel. And they will cancel, especially with kids, because schedules get um, unpredictable sometimes. All right, so you've you know reached out to participants, you're trickling in, you're starting to schedule interviews. Um, the next thing you need to do is to write um, your questions, your testing guide. So when it comes to prepping the questions you're going to ask, um, for younger kids especially, we found that they handled concrete questions um, that are based on their own personal experience more easily. Um, some kids might have trouble with questions that require them to imagine what other people feel. So this can be true for neurotypical kids as well, especially younger ones. Um, but for instance, we had one parent asked to review the questions in advance because um, her daughter was on the autism spectrum and she, she didn't want the child to feel put on the spot if we were going to ask her like, oh, what do you think your friends would think about this? Or what do you think another person would think about this? Um, so, so that's something to be aware of. Um, I'm not saying you can't ever ask about hypotheticals or ask kids to project you know, what they think other people will think. Um, it's just that, you know, be aware of it and have maybe a question in your back pocket that kind of gets at the same thing but maybe couched in more concrete personal terms just in case that the person you talk to um, is struggling with that. Um, another example of this came up when we were drafting some introdu introductory questions to sort of just like warm people up. Um, so I thought, foolishly, that a question like, what's the best thing about being a girl would be like a casual, lowball, easy thing to like, girl talk, let's just jam. Um, terrible idea in retrospect like if someone asked me what's the best thing about being a woman or a Canadian or a designer like I don't know I have to think about it so asking a six-year-old to come up with that on the spot was not the smartest idea um, we had much better luck with questions like, oh, what's your favorite subject in school? What games or TV shows do you like? Um, kids were much more enthusiastic about that. Um, they would you know, tell us about, oh, I like science because I like explosions, or I like math because I'm good at it. And they, people don't think girls are good at math, but I am, and that's cool. Um, and that kind of stuff helps give us those experience criteria for like how, how kids want to feel. Like We want to inspire feelings of pride and excitement. Um, so that can be really valuable beyond just being a warm-up question. Um, 
And this early stumbling block with that bad question, um, that brings me to my next point, which is that you should pilot test your session if at all possible. Um, another way of saying this is like shit test your stuff. Um, you know, find a kid, even if they don't belong to the exact demographic you're looking at, or recruit an extra person and test them early, but give yourself enough time to iterate on, on um, on the, the actual test script. Um, so this will help you avoid these, these issues. So when we pilot tested, we found the first question was bad, so we were able to drop it. Um, even if you can't find an extra person who fits your demographic, like ask a coworker to just role play for you. Um, obviously, it's not gonna be perfect or anywhere close to what a kid will actually say, um, but it'll give you as a researcher just a chance to run through the motions of your script. If you're testing with a special population and there's like special terms that you need to use, it'll just get you used to saying those terms of phrases so you don't like stumble over your words and inadvertently say something that you know is offensive or problematic in any way. Um, as well, we generally recommend that you have at least one other team member with you in in-person sessions taking notes because um, it's a super weird dynamic to like have this in-depth conversation with someone and then be frantically typing and jotting down notes on the side. Um, it kind of makes you seem like a weirdo and it really throws off that session, that, that rapport. Um, so having that trial run can help you and your teammate figure out how to best situate yourself. If you've got recording equipment, how to figure out how to best position that so that when it comes to your real testing sessions, um, you don't have to waste time uh, setting that up and figuring that up. All right, so um, you've scheduled your people, you've recruited them, you've written your questions, you're ready to go. So let's talk about some things that you can do to help your sessions go smoothly. All right. So when you start your sessions, um, when you explain to people what's going to happen, um, framing is always important for any participant, but it's especially important for kids. Um, let them know what to expect because they, you know, they've never heard of a focus group. They don't know what this is. Adults at least have some conceptualization of it, but a kid is just like, there's a weird grown-up in my house now. Okay. So explain to them what's going to happen. Let them know that they can ask questions. Stop if they get tired. Um, if you're going to ask about any potentially sensitive topics or even just if you're asking them about things they didn't like about a particular experience, um, it's important to let them know that no one's going to get in trouble, no one's going to have hurt feelings, like nothing bad is going to happen based on what they do in that session. Um, kids can be susceptible to the social, social desirability effect, which is the desire to say what they think is the good answer, or the socially acceptable answer, even if it's not what they really think. Um, and that can be especially true if there's authority figures present. So you just want to try to build a safe space where kids feel free to be open with you. Um, but then on the flip side, you'll get kids who just have like no filter at all. I showed one design to, I think she was about seven, a seven-year-old kid. And I was like, okay, what do you think you're seeing? What do you think this is for? And she's like, boring stuff. And it was like, okay, well, I guess that's boring. I worked hard on that, but that's cool. And I mean, that's fine. That's honest feedback. She gave the right answer. It looked boring to her, and that's totally fine. And if that happens to you, you can just pat yourself on the back and like, look at what a safe space I created that this child felt free to tell me that my work was boring. So you did a good job if that happens. <laughs> Maybe not on the design, but anyway. Um, yeah, so tell them it's okay if they don't know how to do something. Um, if they get confused, they can tell you so. Um, just like when you're testing with adults, with anybody, you really want to convey the idea that it's not the participant that's being tested. We're not interested in their ability. It's really testing how well or how poorly the site has been built. So we tell them things like, you know, if you find a mistake or something is hard, it's really helpful when you tell us that because that's a mistake that we make and it's going to help us figure out how to make it better for other girls in the future, other kids in the future. Um, so just uh, try to really drive that point home. Um, and yeah, once you're like about to start your questions, uh, creating rapport with your participant is always important. Um, but again, with younger kids, it might they might need a little extra time to warm up to you. So one thing that we helped, um, we found that was helpful was to break the ice by offering the child a choice of activity. Um, more energetic and quieter, uh, just based on the personality type, what they like, but also there might be like a parent sleeping in the other room, so you wanna let them um, not be too disruptive. Uh, for the more energetic option, we had a lot of success with a freeze dance game, so apparently like all five to nine year old girls are really into Katy Perry or Justin Timberlake, so have some songs downloaded. Your Spotify history is gonna get kind of messy, but it's for the sake of research. Um, and yeah, you might feel a little weird dancing with a second grader, but they're not judging you and they're just there to have fun. So you can, you know, channel your inner Elaine Bennis and just let her out. 
Um, having a parent present might also help um, and in fact might be unavoidable because you know most parents are not okay with just leaving their kid alone with some internet stranger that's come into their home. Um, so if that's the case just make sure to let them know ahead of time that they should be silent observers and, and try not to like give the answer to the child or sway them. Um, you can tell them in an email beforehand um, and you can always save a few minutes at the end to ask for the parents feedback and, and impressions just so that they feel included as well. Uh, when you're asking more of these discovery or exploratory questions about preferences, often with adults we'll say, okay, so on a scale of one to five, how would you rate this? How easy or hard would you rate this? Um, for a kid though, you know, it's less straightforward for an, for an adult, they do this stuff all the time, but for a kid they might have a harder time conceptualizing that. So we made use of face scales so that um, we kind of illustrated every decision point or every uh, choice option along the way. Um, from very hard to very easy, and that the second question we had asked them uh, that I'm showing you here is, uh, who do you think should plan your meetings, your girl guide meeting? Should it be just the girls, just the guiders, or girls and guiders? Um, and that just gives us all more confidence that the, the girls themselves understand what we're asking and understand what their options for answering are, and it gives us more confidence that the answer they're giving us is actually legit instead of them just saying the last thing we said because they don't understand what we're trying to ask them. Uh, when it comes to introducing the usability test, so the part where you're actually testing the interface, um, you'll want to keep the language as simple as possible too. So um, in our work, we, we say the word prototype and feedback and usable and these things like very easily, but with a child, you're going to want to keep it simple. So maybe say pretend or fake website instead of a prototype or what you think and what you feel instead of the word feedback, um, just to make sure that they can understand that. Uh, we also found that children were very, very literal when they looked at websites. So um, an adult, if you show them a wireframe, you can just say, oh, this is just like an early mock-up. They'll, they'll probably get it. If they see lorem ipsum, they'll get it. Uh, but kids might not. So you can show them an example of text and say you might see some words that don't look real. That's just because we don't have the real story written yet, but eventually that would go there. Or you know, if you see this gray box, that's just because normally we'd put a picture there, but we don't have it ready yet. So we're just putting a picture there or this box there for now. Uh, just to give them a little bit of heads up about what to expect. Um, and when it comes to testing the prototype itself, um, it's much easier on you as a researcher if you make it as realistic as you can. Like, we tested the site when it was almost ready to be released, and that was literally like, I can just say, try to do this, and I sit back and I watch them. But when it's a clickable comp or a wireframe, because we don't have all of the states mocked up, um, it takes a lot more like finagling and creativity to get them to go where you want them to. Um, and one thing that can make it easier is just to link up all as many states, as many um, options or uh, different screens as you can. Because kids are a lot more willing than adults to just kind of go in and click around um, and click on things that you don't expect. So make sure you do have a quick way to reset the prototype. So, you know, hide some links in the footer that can bring you to certain key screens or something um, just so that you can get your testing back on track. Um, and uh, yeah, use realistic icons and imagery. That's a big one, especially. For younger kids who are still learning to read, that was a big stumbling block we came across because it was a content-heavy site. They had, there were lots of words, but kids couldn't always read yet. Um, so they relied a lot on the, the icons and the imagery, which, um, which also makes it look less boring as well. Not that I'm stuck on that point. Um, get ready for things to go off rail. So kids might see um, you know, a piece of content about camping and then they go off on this long story about how they went camping with a best friend and the dog fell in the river and then they ate fish. And it's, it's a cool story, but um, you, know, you kind of have to bring them back to it. It's totally okay to be like, oh, that's really interesting. Let's talk about that later. But for now, how about you try to you know, find a video on here or whatever. Um, it's totally okay to do that. I think kids are much more used to that type of direction than adults might be. Um, if they really do get lost and they start to get frustrated, like they don't know how to do something, um, you can prompt them by saying, oh, well, what do you think would happen if you click that button? Or what do you think this thing is for? Um, that doesn't work. You'd say, oh, let's just try it together and see what happens, and then ask them afterwards, is that what you thought would happen? Um, and, and try to probe uh, for that that way. Um, I'd also say that you should give positive feedback to the children. Um, some schools of thinking say that you shouldn't give any feedback at all to a user about whether they've done a task correctly or incorrectly. Um, and I personally, I find that that feels very robotic because you're asking a person to do a thing, they do it, and you're just like, mm-hmm, next. It's just like a very strange dynamic. Um, so you don't have to tell them that they did something right or wrong, but you can just say, oh, great, good work, or nice, let's, let's keep going. So you don't have to explicitly say, you did that wrong or you did that right, but just 
just a little bit of feedback to make the, the session go a little bit more smoothly and make the kids not feel like they're you know, failing miserably or something at a task. Um, yeah, so logistics. Uh, as Sun Tzu said, the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. Um, Sun Tzu, the military strategist, ancient China. Um, don't know how he felt about breeding sheep. I was not able to find out his relationship with sheep. Um, so here's a photo of me and my colleague Jesse after one of our in-home sessions. Um, they had this pet pug, this dog, that became obsessed with us. Like he was at one point, like he's still watching us after we're outside waiting for the Uber. Um, at one point he was like sitting on my lap and I'm like reaching over him to try to type notes on my keyboard and interview this child at the same time. Um, it was probably the funniest testing session I've ever sat on, um, sat in on, but um, all that's to say, dress really informally when you do these home visits. Um, and not just because, you know, there might be dogs or you have to sit on the floor or the kid might spill something, um, but you don't want to give the sense of like, I'm this business person, this authority figure who's come into your room to examine you. Like you, I always say dress like a camp counselor, like dress like an adult who they would, who might be used to like taking direction from, but also just like having fun with. Um, so you, you just want to have that openness and, and that casualness in, in your interactions with the kids. Um, for in-home testing, if you have allergies to pets, um, bring medication. If you have allergies to siblings, I don't know how to help you. Um, if you can't be around certain pets, ask ahead of time. Maybe ask them to be put in a bedroom or, or maybe just take, like have someone else do that session for you. Um, when it comes to siblings, um, sometimes parents, you know, if there's only the one of them at home, they can't be with you and the person you're testing and manage the other child. So it's nice to bring like a coloring book or a small toy or something just so that the sibling can um, sit at the same place as you and not be not be bored. Um, download your prototypes. Oh, we found that out the hard way. Uh, you're not going to have Wi-Fi at these people's homes. And even if they, you do, um, it might not be very good Wi-Fi. So make sure your sites, your prototypes are all on your local machine. Uh, bring a mouse as well. So um, mostly like younger kids are very used to using uh, touch pads for most of their digital interactions. If you can test on iPad or iPhone, great. Um, but sometimes as you're developing or designing, you just do the desktop and you're not ready with the responsive yet. So it's totally fine to test the desktop the desktop, but um, it's a good idea to bring a mouse because like a Mac trackpad is really, really tricky for kids to navigate. Um, leave yourself tons of buffer time. Um, people come home late, you know, the kid has to have a snack before they can talk to you, they run off for 15 minutes. You can never predict things as easily as if you're doing a remote session or you're bringing people into your lab. Um, so just make sure you, you're not stressed out about getting to your next appointment in time and leave lots of room there. Um, and then finally, it's always nice to bring a little prize for the kid at the end. So this is in addition to any incentive that you might be offering uh, the parent. Uh, something like a sticker or like stickers that they can choose from or a small toy like the treasure chest at Swiss Chalet. I don't know if you guys remember that when you were kids, uh, but that's always really popular. Uh, we do try to stay away from any food because uh, kids have all sorts of dietary uh, restrictions that we may not know about. Um, and then finally, really at the end of the day, your main goal is to get data, but I'd also argue that you should have fun with it. Like. You know, if we were bankers or lawyers or whatever, like we would not get to sit with kids and watch them work with the tools that we're trying to build. So I think it's a pretty unique and interesting aspect of our work. Um, if a kid is really getting frustrated or bored or tired, it's okay to end early. Like you'll always need to be flexible and think on your feet in any testing scenario. And that's gonna be doubly and triply true when kids or any spo uh, special populations involved. Um, and ultimately I think our job as product creators um, is to treat, our goal is to treat you as well and whether that's you know through the product that we build or through our interactions with them in a testing session I think ultimately you want that person to leave the session with a really really positive feeling about it um, and then one of the best parts about doing this type of research is just seeing the kids like unbridled enthusiasm for things both positively and negatively so it's really inspiring to hear kids talk about you know the ways they like to learn be motivated to do just certain things um, and then as a bonus sometimes they give you really amazing responses that are honestly hilarious and provide great sound bites that you can show your clients like our friend Kiana here who said for a fake website you guys did pretty good uh, so thanks Kiana um, yeah so open yourselves up to being inspired by the energy of these kids that you speak with um, and the users in general that you speak with and hopefully that can carry over um, into the work that you're doing with the product that you're building thank you that's all of our oh yeah also we're hiring so if you're interested you can come find us on Ross or LinkedIn thank you Questions or comments from anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of questions. First of all, approximately how long are these sessions, mm -hmm. and uh, what kind of incentives, and how much? Yeah. Great question. 
just going to repeat the question because it's been recorded. So the uh, question was, how long are the sessions and what's the incentive involved? Um, we try to keep it less than an hour for kids. Um, and really, the testing itself is probably only half an hour with all of the setup involved. Um, just because anything over an hour, they just can't focus. Like adults can't focus after an hour. Um, and for the incentives, um, we typically do a, between 25 to 50 per hour. Um, for the girl guides, they actually just did it for free because they were invested in the program and excited about it. Uh, but when we do these things with um, with people in the world, uh, we, we range from 25 to 50. The more specific your target demographic is, the higher up you'll go. So for families, we might do 50 just because they have to invite us into their houses and that's a bit of a constraint. Um, for if you're just testing adults on like a regular consumer app, um, we get enough people with 25. And then we've gone up to like 100 for very specific people. Like we were talking to, I think, CTOs at some point and, and you know, their time. You kind of like scale it to how much their salary might be, which is kind of a gross way to do it. <laughs> it works. Uh, so yeah, it, it ranges. But I'd say for kids, you're looking at about 25 to 50 for the one hour. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So how do you aggregate all of the intel and then trans transition it into actionable intelligence again? Yeah, great question. So how do we take all the data that we get from the sessions and kind of make it into something we can use? Um, so that's the synthesis process, which follows the research. Um, and essentially, there's lots of methods you can do it. You can do affinity mapping, where you're kind of finding um, similar points of feedback between kids and sort of like clustering them together and say, OK, so this seems like it's all about, I don't know, the exploring flow isn't easy to use, or they want more visuals in this or that. So it's really kind of looking at all of the data and pulling out common themes from different types of users, um, and then creating sort of an output of that. Uh, we also create a user scenario map, which is kind of mapping through the user's needs in a roughly linear way across the product, which is meant to be like a living document for us to make sure that when we are building out the, the product, are we hitting all of these goals? Are we getting all of those goals? Or are there ones that we've deprioritized that we're, as a team, collectively decided that's gonna be a future release or that's not for this product? Um, so it is, that process probably takes, let's say we leave like a week for every two weeks of research to do that. I mean, at some point, it, you can do it faster, but uh, yeah, so it's a lot of, it, it is very qualitative in that way. It's not like a quantitative check, check. Uh, when it comes to usability question, usability testing, it is a bit more quantitative because it, it's kind of just like a pass fail. Um, so if they are able to do the task, if most people are able to do it, then you're probably okay. But if you're finding like 30% of people are failing at the task, then that's something that you can uh, highlight. Does that answer your question? That's perfect, Great. yeah. Cool, yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this, Kind of the purpose of this is to try and apply these tactics to also user testing with adults, correct? Yeah. So is there anything that you find that works particularly well, transfers well between children and adults, and mm. anything that doesn't work at all? Like yeah. Like with stickers? Yeah. Good question. Uh, the question was, you know, how, what, which one of these methods translate well for adults and which ones don't? Um, yeah, stickers, adults are like less into that, although I haven't tried it. Maybe I'd be surprised. Um, adults are obviously much more motivated by the cash incentive. Um, they need a lot less of the warm up stuff because you can just kind of explain. You still want to explain to them what's happening and what the goals are, um, but you can pretty much just dive right into the questions. Um, Generally, it's always good to stick to sort of simpler language regardless, but with adults, obviously, you have a lot more leeway, uh, especially for the types of tools we build because they're so context specific. Like if it's a data admin person trying to manage data centers, you know, there's going to be a lot of lingo that you obviously wouldn't use for a kid. So I think um, with an adult, you still want to do a lot of these, the steps will be there. I think you're just going to have a, a, an easier time with it because you have to spend less energy to think like, will a six-year-old understand this? Uh, but generally, like the recruiting, the framing, the like explaining that it's about the interface and not about them, the debrief, I think the, the general workflow is going to be the same. Yeah. Is there anything that you've done in order to, I guess, make a typical interaction as close to a real life interaction as possible. For instance, mm. I work for TVO, but a large portion of our kids' audience actually visits the site using public computers, be it at a mm. library or at a public school. Mm. Typically, the processing power of those computers is quite yeah. low. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you do if you were to uh, conduct this kind of research at their homes mm -hmm. to simulate that kind of yeah, so the question was um, in cases where 
the technology constraints might be kind of like limiting. Is that is that right? Where like kids are accessing your, your tools um, in a way that it's not ideal, like the bandwidth is bad or the... Well, even in a greater context, let's mm -hmm. say they typically don't access this product via their home mm -hmm. and they typically access it through other means. Mm -hmm. Like, Is there any way to kind of simulate okay. accessing it through other means? Right, so simulate the actual context that they're using it in without actually being in that context. Um, so we haven't had to do that for this project just because like it's kind of where people would use it. We were aware of, you know, the guiders would be using this app or, or the site in the meetings, but they may not always have um, internet life, like data or Wi-Fi where they're meeting, so they we had to make sure that there was enough functionality that they could do offline, so that was one thing we had to think about. Um, but in terms of creating distractions, um, you can always kind of give them a false load task, so if, if it's a kind of a mental load, you just want to have a bit of distraction in the space, you could set things up like, you know, bring a couch into your lab and have them sit, but then also have a TV on that's not related to what they're doing, or play some loud music, or um, you can even do, like this is not very realistic, but you can ask them to do like a cognitive load task concurrently, so like count backwards by from 100 by 3, and like they have to do that while they're doing your task. So it's not the same as, you know, oh, you're in a busy library or you're like in the street, um, but it can sort of add a little bit of stress, I guess, or load to the person as they're doing it. So it's not as clean as, um, as you know, just doing it in a quiet room with no distractions. Um, that being said, it's always gonna be better to do it. Like if you're building an app where you're gonna use it outside, take it outside. Cause like we found that um, some screens, like it looks great inside, but once you're out in sunlight, if it's like a smartwatch, the glare is so much or the, the contrast is an issue. So uh, as much as we can try to mimic it, I think uh, it is important ultimately to at least take it out. Even if you're not testing it with users, take it out yourself and try it out in the context that you would be in. Yeah. I'm curious to know if you've uh, ever been in a session in which so you've got the child over here mm -hmm. and then he or she always looks like mommy or daddy and, mm -hmm. and then and pretty much looks to the parent for the answer yeah. when what really needs to happen is for the child to yeah. actually, um, uh, respond to your prompt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So um, what happens when you want the kid to answer, but they just look to their parent and say, Mom, what do I do? What am I supposed to do? Um, that's when prepping the parent beforehand can really help. So they can be your ally in this case. If you say, you know, the, because we're building this for the four-year-old or the five-year-old to use, we need to know what they're doing. So if they ask you about it, um, help us out by redirecting it back to them to say, I don't know, what do you think? You know, just ask them to sort of be your ally in that testing session. Um, and then sometimes it's, you know, the parent just won't listen to you or maybe you didn't remember to remind them. So they'll just answer for the kid and they'll just like lead the kid. And that can be frustrating, but it's also not completely unrealistic because if a kid doesn't know what they're doing, they're gonna ask their parent anyway. So you can still get good data out of that. It's just, uh, if you set it up in advance to tell the parent to try to like redirect it back to the kid, um, that's the ideal scenario if they can help you out. But even if not, I, you can still get worthwhile data out of that because you know it's not unlikely that a parent and a child are going to work on the same interface together. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much.